Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our partner event. Tonight is the second of three panel discussions on building inclusive communities. We'd like to begin tonight with an introduction of the organizations collaborating to bring you this event. So first we have Cindy Parsons. Hi, my name is Cindy Parsons and I'm the director of the St. Croix Family Resource Center. We work with youth with unstable housing and we work with low income families. We have two drop-in centers for youth, which are open by appointment during the pandemic, one in Stillwater and one in Cottage Grove. Um, we've been, this is the fifth year that we've been doing building community events. And after our event in 2008, a series looking at race, culture, and religion, we, it was time to do another series. And so we decided right now, diversity, equity, and inclusion is really important to be addressing and we were so fortunate to be joined by Youth Service Bureau and Southwash Co-Cares um, to bring you these three panel discussions. All will be recorded so you can share them with others and um, so anyway just I extend a warm welcome to our panelists and all who are joining us tonight. And I'll introduce myself next. Um, my name is Mary with Youth Service Bureau. And Youth Service Bureau is at awesome, ultimately many people know us as YSB. We are a local nonprofit serving families in Washington County. We get families from Western Wisconsin and Ramsey and Dakota County even. Um, our agency started actually as with our diversion services, which is really helping kids hold a student accountable while giving them a second chance. Um, that's one of the areas, program areas. We also have youth and youth family focused counseling, which right now, because of the pandemic, we're also serving clients in office and through teletherapy. Um, we see families from, with children five to 25 years old and next service area. We have school-based mental health and chemical health. We're an early intervention prevention organization, also doing that research, but care, group work and individual work, um, meeting kids where they're at and giving them the tools to resist and abstain from substances. Um, the area I'm in is youth family education, many community presentations. Obviously, this is part of um, presentations that we would be delivering. We work with three school districts. I apologize. I think I forgot to mention that. We're in District 20, 833 and 834, which is Washington County, Oakdale, from Cottage Grove all the way up through Stillwater area and Maplewood, Oakdale area. I welcome you to check out youthservicebureau.net and Thank you. I thank our panelists. I thank all the work that has gone into bringing these beautiful messages, the collaboration, and I hope you all have a great learning evening tonight. Thank you, Cindy and Mary. I am Cheryl Jogger. I'm your host for tonight. Um, I'm the founder of Sawashko Cares. Sawashko Cares stands for South Washington County Community Action Reaching Every Student. Our overall mission is to set our students up for success in every way that we can. And we do this by engaging the community to meet student needs. Um, but what we're really trying to do is to just build connections among the people living in our community and really help people take care of each other. Um, because ultimately what our children and what really all of us need most is to be seen and heard and feel valued and to know that we are part of a community that cares. And that's what Sawashko Cares is really about. It's our community helping our community. Um, so thank you all for being here tonight. Tonight's topic is how to have self helpful and safe conversations about diversity, equity, and inclusion. This topic is very timely as it feels like we are more divided than we've ever been as a country and we're going to have to figure out how to come back together again at some point. Um, as we were planning this event, you know, the, we talked about how we didn't want it to become too political. And then we, we also talked about how really the, the true definition of politics is 
is advocating for the rights of people. And that's really what diversity, equity, and inclusion is about, I think. And so um, we encourage you, the viewers, to also um, participate in our discussion this evening um, in the chat if you'd like to share where you're from and uh, maybe even why you are interested in this topic. And if you have questions, please use the Q&A feature to send our panel members a question. And um, as Cindy mentioned, a quick reminder, this event is being recorded and will be available on each of our uh, partner organizations website and we welcome you to share it with others. So now a very special thank you and welcome to our four panel members tonight. Uh, we have Brandon Jones, Doug Pelchek, Vivian Jenkins Nelson, and Timmy Ogundepe. We are so excited to have you join us tonight. We want this to be a true conversation among the four of you. Um, I will direct questions to each speaker, but please feel free to jump in where you see fit. Um, and we'll also be trying to weigh, weave uh, viewer questions in where we can. So let's get started. Panelists, when I call on you, please take two minutes to introduce yourself and share about your interest in joining us for this conversation. Vivian, would you like to go first? No, but I will. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'm Vivian Jenkins Nelson, and um, I'm a senior fellow at Augsburg College. I was the first black professor there. Um, I'm um, located in the social work department. I'm a social psychologist. I've been in counseling. I've taught counseling at the U. I've also um, uh, got a great interest and we we teach this um, we're the only school actually doing it we decide outside of the, um, the center for uh, intergroup dialogue at the university university of and uh, of wisconsin at ann arbor and so our senior social work students uh, go through this course and and uh, lab uh, before they graduate and to make a long and tedious story a little short er um, I also teach at Luther Seminary and I teach an anti-racism course which has been been doing that for about 14 years and um, I also teach at the Center uh, for uh, purposeful leadership for the women's whole purpose leadership course and um, I, my interest in this is I was born in the civil rights movement. As my mom said, I was a civil rights baby. <laughs> so um, anyway, um, I, I just sort of picked up from where they, where they left off, I guess. And they were also uh, teachers and academics. So uh, one thing about all of this for me is, as my mom used to say, is uh, get an education because they can't take that away from you. And uh, they were missionaries in uh, Alabama uh, during a very virulent time of KKK and all of that, all of that. So anyway, uh, I was born in Selma. We were thrown out of Selma. So um, um, I also write, so um, I'm trying to now put that all together um, and tell their story uh, as well as my brother and my, and my story. So I'm interested in this because it's my life work. And uh, so thanks for inviting me. Thank you so much for being here. Timmy, would you like to go next? Hi everyone, Timmy Ogundepe, founder of Safe Resell, also host of a podcast I recently started called Shed Some Light Podcast. Um, it's a podcast about uh, police brutality, people of color coming in, sharing their experiences with police brutality, um, racial profiling, targeting, and more. Um, I started that podcast um, after the George Floyd tragedy. Um, I, I just had a daughter, a newborn, and I didn't want to go out and expose myself to um, COVID when all the protesting was happening, but I felt um, something inside me saying I have to do something, right? So I spent that weekend just thinking about what I can do to, to help out. And throughout conversation with my um, white counterparts that weren't exactly informed as to why 
us as people of color were so upset with the situation, I realized that they don't really understand what we go through, you know, on an everyday basis down there. So um, I started that podcast um, going well. I had to um, take a longer um, break in between season one and season two because I just moved. But um, season two is starting back up in December, and I'm very excited about that to bring more stories and more insight as to what we go through. And I'm excited about this conversation because not only am I a business owner, um, but I feel like it's not talked about often. Um, I feel like people are more or less afraid to bring it up. And when it comes to the workplace, yeah, they might talk about it with their friends and family, but in the workplace, they may be hesitant because they don't want to say the wrong thing or um, shed a negative light on the person. So long story short, I'm excited to talk about it because of that reason and to really see how we can bring conversation up in the workplace. Thank you. Thanks, Timmy. Doug, would you like to go next? Sure, my name is Doug Pelchak. I'm the uh, Professional Development Coordinator at Adler Graduate School out in Minnetonka. We train um, marriage and family therapists, licensed professional counselors, art therapists, and the uh, program I'm most allied, allied with is the school counseling program. I was a school counselor for a lot of years, uh, did not want to retire, had to keep going, or else I would have driven my entire family nuts. So I uh, wound up working at Adler, starting the school counseling department there. Um, very mission driven when it comes to this. Um, I see it in the schools all the time, uh, sensitizing our, our therapists, um, our students um, to these issues, dealing with racial incidents at their school but more, more, even more uh, foundationally, how to um, begin to modify the systems in which they work in to represent the, uh, client, the clientele of the population that they serve. And the thing I'm excited to share a little bit about tonight is I'm co-leader of a, um, a social justice equity task force that um, myself and 20 of my uh, school counseling colleagues, we meet with monthly and uh, we do awareness activities together and also uh, work on um, things that are on schools to work towards that goal that I talked about earlier. I'm very excited about it. Um, gives me hope, gives me energy. I love being with those people every month and uh, makes me not want to give up. Thank you so much for being here, Doug. Brandon, our old friend, would you like to introduce <laughs> yourself? Sure thing. It's good to be back. Uh, greetings, everyone. Good evening. My name is Brandon Jones. A psychotherapist professor at Metro State. I teach grad school. Uh, one of the courses that I teach is culturally responsive and anti-oppressive services. So this is this conversation is right up my alley. I also teach undergrad and I bounce between several other our community colleges, including Ember Hills, Century College, and Dakota County Technical College. And then when I'm not doing those two things, I'm also a consultant uh, through my own business, uh, Jegna Consulting, where I work with uh, schools, nonprofit organizations, and governmental entities on developing curriculum, developing programming, and then also do a lot of training and just general consulting uh, to help improve the lives of young people. Um, and that includes equity, diversity, and inclusion, because we can't get away from the diverse the diversity that we're in. I know that unfortunately, after the you know the death of George Floyd, what ended up happening was everybody started to focus on diversity, but diversity is something that we should have been focusing on from the beginning because no matter where we eat, play, live, learn, laugh, all those things that we do involves diversity and we have to continue to push forward as a nation. So I look forward to today's conversation. Thanks, Brandon. Again, thank you all for being here. Um, let's get started. Vivian, I'd like to start with you. Um, why is it so challenging to have conversations around race, religion, and politics? And why are these conversations important um, when everyone seems so set in their beliefs? Why should you even bother? That's exactly why. Everybody is so set uh, in their own beliefs. And somewhere we have got to uh, really start talking to each other at, in very meaningful ways. We've had a lot of, um, uh, of stuff that we call dialogue, which basically um, is people talking at each other or yelling at each other, as the case may be. But we have got to get to a point where um, 
as Timmy says, we, where we can talk openly and we can talk, um, I, you know, I hate the word safe. I, I just have gotten to the point where it just makes me crazy. Uh, you can't be safe. You got to be courageous if you're going to uh, uh, really take on these talks. And, uh, and what I want to say, too, is that we have to work, and this is really hard, uh, toward uh, a place where we can trust each other. Uh, so, in other words, what I'm saying here is that uh, in our work at Augsburg, we're not just talking, we're doing good talk. But our students are, we have a, our master's is in uh, social, it has a social justice um, uh, center to it. So students uh, do good talk, learn how to do that, do the, be respectful, but also learn how to take action. And uh, I, I, I just, there was so much talk during the 60s and 70s. Uh, I, I could just like jump off a bridge if anybody asked me to uh, engage in that kind of stupid stuff. Excuse me. I'm also a church lady and I curse. I just want you to know. I'm warning you. <laughs> Would anyone else like to address that? Why, why even bother with these conversations? Why are they important? I could jump in. You know, I, th I think these conversations are important because you can't escape it. I know people try to, they try to show themselves or move to areas where it's, there's not a lot of inclusion. But as we continue to move forward, as technology gets better, as we become more of an internet driven society, we are more connected than we are uh, than any other time in history. And you can't escape it. And this is why there's a lot of frustration around actually dealing with race, religion, sexuality, et cetera, because it's in everybody's faces. And there are a lot of people who just don't feel comfortable with difference. And that's unfortunate because one of the things that we have to do, and I'm with Vivian on this, is we've been talking for so long. At some point, it needs to just be actions. You have to be able to be in a space of discomfort and be okay with that. There's no growth um, in a comfort zone, and there's no comfort in a growth zone. You have to be able to push through and be courageous enough not just to listen and to talk, but also to back it up with actions, whether that is in hiring practices, developing relationships or friendships, um, treating somebody different, um, apologizing. There are things that people need to do because it's the right thing to do if we are saying that we are righteous people. That's great. I like the, um, that you have, you know, you talk about not just talking, but following through with action and are there other concrete action steps? Um, you mentioned hiring, you know, developing friendships, apologizing. Um, is there anything else that people can actually take action towards? People can speak up when they see injustice. Um, a lot of people remain silent, whether that's just through their cultural customs or they don't want to get involved with anything that may be controversial, but being able to speak up um, is very important. Uh, and that doesn't mean that it needs to be a dialogue, but being able to just step forward and let someone know, hey, I see what you're doing, or I see what's happening here, and it's not right. Um, being able to have conversations amongst people that you feel most comfortable with is also another important step. And that's for everyone. Um, you know, we won't, we get, we talk about brave spaces and feeling safe when it comes to talking to, with other people that you know, don't share the same background as us, but really the fruitful dialogues are the people that you know, care about and love the most, because those are the folks who are actually going to listen to you more and actually care about what you say. And, you know, we, we get so comfortable not engaging in those dialogues because we don't want to upset people or we don't want people to judge us in a particular way. And that's not how change happens. So I think that those are just some of the things that we can end up doing, but being, being, being open to having different experiences and to um, being able to share differences and, and be okay with things being different is a huge action step. Can I, uh, can I jump on Brandon's comment there real quick? 
Um, one of the successes that we had in our group at Adler is that we sent out a, a, a mailing to 100 and, our 180 alumni that we had. And we had uh, 25 people volunteer to become part of this task force. And speaking to your point, Brandon, um, even though they all didn't know each other, they came out of that, our, the same graduate school that you went to. So there's a certain air of familiarity and believing in, work, in social justice and making, making the world better that made us be able to get going faster. And as far as safe space, I wouldn't say it's a safe space, but it's a caring space where all of us around care about each other just because of the roots that we, they, we, we come from. And that's made our individual dialogue and we do a, a growth experience every month responding to a video, a topic, and then we talk about what we're doing at our different sites. But we wouldn't be near where we are if we didn't have that, that base where we all had a common mission and common goal, even though the schools that we work in are very different um, in, in their culture and character. Doug, um, do you typically talk about issues uh, regarding diversity, equity, inclusion with family and friends and coworkers? Like who should we be having these conversations with and when is the right time? <laughs> well, coworkers is the easiest. We could coerce them to doing it as, as um, we can coerce our, our coworkers and do as part of their training at Adler. I mean, they have to attend our professional development sessions. And it's not it's not hard to get them to attend there, but that the mission through the work is one way that it's easier to translate through. Friends, it's a little bit more difficult. Family, you know, both of my kids went to the protests um, um, about George Floyd, and they came home, and I had they sat down, they were real proud of themselves, and I looked at both of them, and I said, "Okay, what are you going to do now?" And I never saw a more perplexed look on two uh, people's faces when I asked them that question. And I think they're still both uh, wrestling with that. And you know, that's the one that I wrestle with the most, is that it's easy to have the conversations that be painful at times, but putting that into action is what matters. And that, that's, that's my, my theme with all of my students and, and everyone that we're working with. I don't care if it's a small thing, um, if you take on like, one class, one do, do one person, you just got to keep things moving. You got you got to move things off of your comfort zone to a different place, and we're able to reinforce with each other and pat each other on the back and encourage each other, give each other resources in the group that we're working in. That's easier for me to do my, with my coworkers than it is with my friends and family. Um, they just don't have as much patience for me <laughs> as my coworkers tend to. Doug, I'm opposite of you. I think for me, um, it's easier to talk to family and friends um, about issues with DEI and not coworkers because with coworkers, you kind of have to watch what you say, right? Because you don't know who's going to go ahead and, and be offended by it or go ahead and run and tell, you know, managers or whatnot. And you really have to watch what you say because you don't want to say the wrong thing. With family and friends, I can be upset about what's going on and just, you know, say all types of F-bombs and S-words and whatnot. <laughs> and feel comfortable because I know, okay, they're friends and family, but that's me being more open because similar to, uh, I think Vivian says she had a potty mouth. I do too. So <laughs> you have to be really, all I have to say, I'm very hesitant to talk about it with coworkers because I don't know how they're going to take it. Family and friends, if they don't take it well, I personally don't really care. But with coworkers, if they don't take it well, I know I might get in trouble, get written up, might potentially get fired. So you kind of shy away from those conversations in the workplace unless something big happens like the George Floyd murder. Um, before um, Judge George Floyd happened, um, I also worked full time in higher education. Um, my university, I didn't see not pretty much anything regarding that, right? Then when the George Floyd things happened, we haven't changed in left and right. I don't know if I can talk about it because of insider trading. Anyway, <laughs> um, so I just think that before the large event or the big event happened, it was a lot harder to talk to coworkers. And I'm afraid that if things settle down, even though I want to settle down, that conversation is going to be less and less. Or those conversations, excuse me. We do have a viewer question I'd like to throw in there. Um, how can we make changes to hiring practices in a system that is rooted in structural racism? Uh, 
Can I have a run at that one? Okay. Um, I work with corporations on a fairly regular basis. And uh, what I see a lot of is F and F recruiting, and that's friends and family. And so we've got to break that mold. We've got to look outside of the people we know, the people we're comfortable with. And you know, there's some hor horrible research. I was just rereading it the other day um, about the prejudice about people's names and about how if somebody has something that looks like an African-American name or an African name or whatever, uh, uh, they don't get callbacks, even though they are qualified for jobs. So when you see, when you see stuff like that going on, you got to say something and you got to do something. And more important, let me just say this, is that You've got to review everything that you do uh, for uh, for implicit bias. I know that's a real uh, buzzword right now, but in other words, um, seen and unseen policies and practices. You've got to turn them over, look at them really hard, and do something about them. And I'm complete. I'm done. We have a follow-up to that. Um, how do you hold leadership accountable? Hmm. Isn't that interesting? I'm going to let somebody else go for that one. I think anytime you're opposing leadership, it becomes difficult. And I would just say it depends on your position. Um, if you if you're in if you're in a leadership position, it may be a little easier to have influence on your peers. But let's say you're not, then I think what ends up happening is you have to utilize your HR department one or two. You have to utilize your peers on your work level to organize and demand. Hey, we need this. We need more diverse voices, or we need additional training, or we just need support in this particular area because we know that we're not doing well. Um, if you are a person in one of the dominant or privileged groups you have a lot more ability to do those things and request those things than folks who are not. Um, so utilize your privilege if you have it. Uh, I think that that's always a great step. But opposing leadership is hard. If you work in a nonprofit organization, it might be a letter from the staff to the board saying, hey, we need to do something about what's going on. If you work corporate, you have to go through HR channels. So I would just use the appropriate channels that are there because everyone says that they're an equal opportunity employer but everyone doesn't equally opportun <laughs> or opportunity employ the policies when it comes to being equitable across different um, ethnic and especially racial lines. Did you notice any of you guys uh, that California has officially voted out affirmative action for, uh, for workplace, also um, for college admissions and that sort of thing? Hmm. I didn't think you could do that. I mean, that's a federal law. How, how, how do you do that? I have no idea. <laughs> well, I found it perturbing. I'm sorry. But <laughs> Our next question is for Brandon. How do you make space for different viewpoints, perspectives, and experiences? And how can we respectfully discuss things without belittling others' differing views? Yeah, the best way to make space um, for you know, dis different voices, different perspectives, is to be intentional about it. Um, I think a lot of these conversations happen unintentionally. Usually a boundary or expectations cross, and now we have to address a problem. But if you're taking intentional actions to have these conversations and to point out within your organization, in your family, uh, you know, in your social group that, hey, we need to have a little bit more of a diverse perspective here and being intentional about it, I think that's a good way to start driving home those conversations. Um, but with that, you know, it can be challenging and people can feel targeted. People can feel belittled. And I, I really think that it's about the individuals who are participating in those conversations to kind of check themselves and not be defensive. 
um, because there there will be things that you don't understand. There will be things that may rub you the wrong way or may, you know, light a fire under you. But at the end of the day, if what is the overall goal of the conversation? Is the goal to seek understanding and to grow or is the goal to defend what's currently going on and not to make any changes? And, and that's something that I think starts with the individual who's engaging in those dialogues in their circle. I also think there's certain um, structures that you can use. Um, there's a technique called the circle of voices technique that uh, Stephen Brookfield um, uses where a, a prompt is presented and everyone gets a chance to reflect and everyone in the circle gets a chance uh, to reflect on the prompt in front of everyone else. And uh, it's very intentional. It goes one by one. You know when your turn is going to be. And then your second round of the discussion, um, if you comment, it has to be based on what somebody has talked about uh, in the first round. And I found that to be an incredibly uh, useful technique, not only uh, around this area, but in a variety of other ones. But it's come particularly handy in this equity group that I do work with. And it's, uh, it's helped us get a lot of growth and, and uh, empowered a lot of space and, and think time for people. So the reactions did not become so impulsive. People were able to kind of think through um, what they said, even if some of the things that they were saying were are fairly emotionally charged people tended to accept that more. Doug, can I um, just um, footnote something you're saying there? Mm -hmm. uh, because th that sounds very much like intentional listening. Very much so. And we do entirely too much talking and not enough listening. Uh, in fact, I think our, our country is crippled in that way. And, um, you know, listening is uh, is not as easy as it sounds because you've got to listen for things people aren't saying, listening for the elephant in the room. You, uh, the Africans have a wonderful saying in Western Africa is that you listen with the third ear, which is your heart. Mm, I love that. Yep. So you're listening for uh, people's emotions. You're listening for your own. Mm -hmm. you know, because we talk a lot and that covers uh, our own insecurities and et cetera. When you are... I'm sorry. Oh, ahead. sorry. No, please go ahead. I was just going to say, we've just got to start listening to each other in a respectful way. That's the only way we're going to get over this huge divide that we've got. And no, I don't want to hear a lot of crap about... Uh, you know, uh, some half-baked racist stuff uh, from somebody. But, you know, if I'm going to be respectful, I'm going to have to listen. Okay. Or just stop talking about it. And just get out of the way. Let other people who are going to really do this work. It's hard work. But it's also joyful work when it works. <laughs> Is there a proper response to um, something somebody says that's just beyond your comprehension? Oh, yes. How do you respond to that? I'm going to let somebody else talk. Timmy, what do you got to say about that? Because you're doing a blog on that very thing. Well, first of all, I repeat back what I think I heard. Right. Yeah. When they ask an comment, I'm like, wait a minute, did you just say X, Y, and Z? If they say yes, I'm like, okay, well, can you can you delve deeper into that? What do you mean by that? What what why you think that? So on and so forth. If it's still asking that, I'm going, I'm leaving. Because at this point, <laughs> if you've explained it <laughs> twice already and is to the best of your ability, I still understand it. I'm like, look, this ain't this conversation ain't get anywhere. Um, but no, all jokes aside, really listening and getting, getting them to um, tell you more about, or say more about what they're feeling, what they're thinking, what they've heard, will get you to hopefully understand what they're saying more. And if they don't, again, if you don't understand it, that means they're just absolutely batshit crazy. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> so, is, that diagnosis, is that diagnosis in the DSM-5, that, that, is that in there? <laughs> no, I'm looking for that one. I didn't find it yet. <laughs> 
It'll be in the DSM six in <laughs> a couple <of> years. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> you know, to follow up on Timmy's comments, you know, I think it is appropriate to disengage in conversation that you don't find beneficial. I think one of the things that people, especially people of color or BIPOC, BIPOC folks, is we feel obligated to change the hearts and minds of people who don't want their hearts and minds changed. We spend a lot of energy and time trying to do that. And I think that that's counterproductive. So if there is a time where people do engage in dialogue that is not beneficial, you know, it is appropriate for you to disengage and to take, you know, your time and energy somewhere where it could be used a lot more beneficially. Do you all think that we can agree to disagree? Is that a, is that a thing? Is there always common ground to be found? And what should we focus on in order to find that common ground? My initial thought is no. Um, agreeing to disagree in this, in this particular topic or situation, I don't think is doable. I think it has to change to compromise, right? You have to compromise, not agree to disagree. Because then if you agree to disagree, that means one party's viewpoint is undermined, right? Opinion undermined. And it's like, how can you undermine some uh, person of color's viewpoint about diversity? How can you undermine a person of color or even, you know, um, age, sex, doesn't really matter, viewpoint about, hey, I don't feel included. You know, like, okay, how, oh, you do feel included, let me walk away. No, it's, hey, I don't feel included. Why don't you feel included? Okay, let's compromise to see how we can get you feeling included to the best art of my ability or the company's ability or whatever the case may be. So I don't think in terms of DEI, it's, we can't really agree to disagree, but we need to get better at, at cap compromising. Mm, that's a great. And compromising is not a weak place at all. And we have this notion that compromise is somehow um, giving in or giving up or whatever, it, and, and it is not, it really isn't. We have a viewer question as well. How can we respond with love instead of fear and anger when things are scary in the world? <laughs> I'm laughing because if I knew that, I would be a cajillionaire at this point. Uh, I wish I knew. I mean, you know, it's, it's very tough. That is a tough one. I think that you know, sometimes responding in anger is appropriate. Um, what you do with that anger is a whole nother thing, right? Are you hurt, hurting yourself or lashing out at other people? Um, you know, you can't, one of the things that I've learned over my years of being in the mental health world is sometimes your emotional responses can't be controlled, but what you do with those emotions that you have can. And it's okay to be angry. It's okay to respond gracefully. It's okay to compromise. What do you do with that? And how does that sit with you as an individual is very important. Uh, Cause a lot of times people internalize it and blame themselves, you know, they're kicking themselves in the, in the back saying, and I should have said something, or I should have stepped up or why did I let that person over talk me? And sometimes you just have to learn from that, you know, that loss, take it as a lesson and move forward because, you know, you're not going to solve all the world's problems, especially when it comes to uh, diversity, equity, inclusion with just conversations. Like it does take action as well. And, and you can't be the only person doing the work. In Adlerian psychology, all emotions are purposeful, as is all behavior. And I think if you tune into your emotions and the, and the, the driver behind it, uh, it can help lead you to a better goal. You just can't case stay stuck in the anger. And a lot of times when I've gotten caught up in my anger, I lose my strategic and I lose, and I lose my ability to respond uh, effectively. I just get caught up in the other person's drama which a lot of times is their purpose anyway, is they're trying to hook me into uh, their frame to do that dance uh, with them that they're so used to dancing. And uh, feeling that anger, I think is all good, but what you do with it, you gotta rise above and be strategic and take a deep breath before you respond. Or as some people have mentioned, sometimes you gotta leave the room. Yes, and uh, part of the anger literature suggests that um, there are, uh, that anger is a secondary or a reforming 
um, uh, action, that there are many um, emotions that come first that we haven't dealt with and are not dealing with. And so we, we deal with it by getting mad. And what it does um, is I do mad really well. Yeah, so, um, you know, people like back off and they like, oh, I don't want you to get mad with me. You know, it's like, get a grip. Uh, you know, everybody gets mad. Sometimes it's appropriate. Sometimes it's not. But in any event, we ought to be being thoughtful about, so why am I mad? Why, why am I in this place? How did I get there? Is there anything I can do to change it? Or is it systemic? And that's the hard place, as particularly for people of color and women. If a conversation does get out of hand, do you have any advice on how to de-escalate the conversation? And when, and we touched on this a little bit before, but when is it time to end the conversation and how do you do so respectfully? Yeah, I'll, I'll dive out on this one. I think ending the conversation respectfully for yourself and the other person you're having a conversation with may be very different. <laughs> so what I would suggest is if you feel any inkling that you are uncomfortable with the dialogue, that is an appropriate time for you to exit. Whether the conversation is not finished or you didn't get your viewpoint across or the other person's yelling, whatever the case may be, once you feel uncomfortable, it's okay for you to disengage. Um, you know, bowing out respectfully is being able to be assertive enough to stand up for yourself and say, you know, this conversation is not really working out for me right now and I, I have to disengage. That can be hard. You could be in a workplace setting in a meeting. You could be talking to your partner. You could be talking to one of your parents or a family member. Not the easiest thing to do, but you have to have a little level of, of, of assertiveness to take care of your needs and not allow a conversation to dictate your emotions. And then again, uh, there are conversations that we always run from. That is very true. <laughs> so say, say a little bit more about that, please. Yeah, but yes, so I would, I would agree with Vivian. That, that doesn't mean that you should run from all the conversations, because there are people who, when it comes to talking about male-female dynamics, they're like hands off. They don't talk about it. LGBTQ plus issues, they don't want to talk about it. At some point, you do have to make a decision to engage in these conversations, especially if you have an expectation that things are going to change. If you're somebody who doesn't have that expectations, you're obviously working against things changing, so you're probably not having those dialogues anyway. Um, if you are in a situation where you feel like you don't want to have the conversation, but you think is necessary, that may be an opportunity for you to sit and be an active listener to learn what is making you uncomfortable about the actual dialogue. Conversation is too, to me, it's a two way street. It's not just about you talking and getting your point across. It's also about listening and getting some understanding for other people's perspectives as well. Exactly. I think it was John Gottman, who's a very famous marriage therapist, studied all these videotapes on conflict. And one of the findings is he had us that in the first three minutes, the conversation is going badly. You better get out and regroup and come back at it again later. And, uh, you know, from personal experience, I could test that that's true. Uh, <laughs> many times I should have regrouped in my life after the first three minutes, but I think uh, that's a telltale sign because you can just get caught in that quicksand and the, it, that's just what it's like. It, you get caught in that quicksand, get caught up in that personal drama around the anger. You got to regroup, but I agree with you, Brandon, you got to get back at it later. You, you got to come back at it. You just can't avoid it but come back with it when you're not so flustered and maybe the other person's in a different uh, frame of mind. I'm, I'm curious, how um, do you each have people in your lives that you just vehemently don't agree with, but you still have a close relationship with them? Is that, is that possible? And is that a good thing? This is a bad night to be asking that. <laughs> <laughs> My dog. This is My dog. At the end of the week, I could answer this a little bit better. But <laughs> tonight, 
I, I'm not so sure. <laughs> oh man, don't we all? I mean, <laughs> I do. <laughs> there is my mom. Okay, a uh, picture of the two of us, and uh, I mean, we went at it hammer and tongs from the time I was a little girl until she died at 102. But I mean, you know, she could embarrass me publicly like nobody else. I mean, like no one else. At 70, the woman could embarrass me, okay? Well, anyway, so it, when you think about it, yeah, there, I, I think we, I don't know about other people, but I have people in my family that I love, loved and loved dearly that uh, drive me crazy, okay? Can we just go there? Yeah, and who you just wanna say, stop talking now, okay? Just stop talking. Yeah, definitely. And was there something else to that, Cheryl, about that question? Was it, was there more to it than I'm saying here? Nope, that was good. So oh. how about the rest of you? I, uh, I am my pops. Love him to death. Don't get along with that guy. Um, biggest reason could we, well, we're, I'm African, I'm born in Africa, he was raised in Africa, so he has a lot of African um, culture still embedded in him, mm -hmm. and I've been here since I was three years old, so I'm as American as he gets, basically. Um, anyway, I know Brandy was talking about earlier that when um, conversation gets uncomfortable, you get up and leave, and my first thought process, not in the African household, nope. Oh, no, 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 no. no. Get hit. <laughs> <laughs> Something flying across your head, huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but no, his his viewpoints aren't bad enough. It's terrible, but it's little things like, hey, he didn't grow up in that environment. So why am I growing up in that environment? For example, underage drinking. Don't do it. I did it. He didn't understand why I had to do it. I said, hey, it's fun. Things like that. Oh, <laughs> 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 so, yes. Yeah, so my pops love him to death. Can't spend more than, you know, an hour with him, just him and I, without us getting at each other. So. <laughs> Yes, that this is a tough one. I think I think we all have people that we love and care about who have opposing views on things. And for me, it's really about connecting on things that we do agree on and um, minimizing conversations on the things that we don't if it's not going to be a productive conversation. So, um, yeah, so I also do have people that we do not share the same views on many different of these big things like race, politics, religion, etc. It'd be also some, you know, there are have to relationships and want to relationships. And uh, I have a hard time on this one with people uh, where, uh, where it's a choice thing. I got to be honest. Really do, takes a lot of energy away from me uh, to be in space with that. Um, much better for me to be people that uh, have a shared value system about those core things about humanity and view of uh, human work and uh, the importance of belonging and contributing and uh, working on a horizontal plane. It's another Adlerian concept. Uh, people that don't share that, I have a really hard time being close, close with by choice. Do you all think that it's possible to change people's minds who think differently than you? <laughs> Especially about diversity, uh, equity, and inclusion? Yeah, if I'm grading them, sure. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it can be possible but it is it is difficult um i think many people don't change their viewpoints until something slaps them in the face whether that's racism something from a religious standpoint sexuality when it hits home that's when people want to start considering other perspectives and viewpoints and as long and what i've learned with that especially when it comes to dealing with ethnicity and race as long as i stay on my square and I continue to kind of preach my preach and stay on my mission where it comes to being, you know, diverse and, and equitable as possible, then they know where to come and have those dialogues. And that's happened to me with several people who I, I thought they'll never change their perspective until something happened, whether they were racially profiled or they had an incident at work or, you know, some, somebody told them something that they didn't like. And then they were open to having that conversation because it hit them personally. Yeah, or it happens to somebody that you care, that they care about. Right. Then, then it gets real. Then it gets real, you know. Just like COVID, that's when it gets real, you know. 
It's not just an amorphous thing. It's in, it's in your backyard. I, I agree with Brandon with that one. Um, it doesn't change. People feel born don't change unless it slaps you in the face. Um, quick little example on my end. Uh, my son, um, his mom is white, um, lives up in Fargo, North Dakota. Uh, with That's where she lives. He's with me. And she was telling me about a story where she was at the park and some person came up and started asking questions about me. Like, is he is he in his life? Does he pay a child? Just all types of unnecessary questions. And I, in my mind, it's like, oh yeah, that's normal. Like people always just assume that the black dad isn't in the kid's life, the, the parents aren't together, right? So I'm just like, okay, like for me, I didn't, I know it's wrong, but it's normal for me. She's like, oh my God, this is what happens and all. And she's asking all these questions. And in my mind, I'm like, you 26 years old, you just now realizing this happens. But then, like to Brandon's point, she didn't experience it until she had to experience it. And that changed her mind. Mm -hmm. Or opened her mind, I should say. Mind, yeah. mm -hmm. And speaking about questions, I want to just follow that up, uh, too. Uh, there's a lot to be said for uh, talking about how we ask questions respectfully. Okay, when I first came to Minnesota, um, white people were always asking me stuff that I thought was none of the business. Like, uh, where do you work? How much do you make? We're like, wait, 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 hold up, you know, uh, that's none of your business. But I, you know, but I was also raised uh, to be respectful and nice and all that sort of stuff. And uh, I was at a party I was the only black person that happens a lot in Minnesota and it never happened to me before. And so I'm out somewhere in YZ and um, uh, thinking I'm probably going to die at the end of this dirt road. Nobody would ever find my body. But anyway, it was uh, uh, one of these afternoon she she parties. And um, I should say I wasn't the only black person there. There was a maid and there was a butler and we were outdoors, okay? And I tried to speak to the maid and the butler and they like, ig me, that's short for ignore. Okay, that's black doctor ignored, okay. So uh, I was like, oh, this is weird. I, in the first place, I had never seen a butler. This guy was sweeping up butts off the grass, okay? And the maid was in this little French deal with the, you know, with the, you know, the whole thing. So it, it was, I was just shocked. So everybody, I was, I came to the party. I was invited to the party. It was a birthday party with a colleague, with a white colleague who just invited me to go out, you know, uh, to his birthday. So I said, fine, sure, you know. And uh, every person there wanted to know, how did I meet him? I'm like, what? Uh, we work together, you know what? And, and finally, it was just, it was just beyond what I could stand, okay. So the lady of the house, it was an older white lady, she came out and she introduced herself to me. And she started up with, and how did you meet? And I said, wait, hold up. If I had known I needed to bring a resume to this party, uh, I would have put some in the car. But uh, here's the deal. I met him hooking on Plymouth Avenue. Okay, and she was like, oh, 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 I'm so sorry. Let me start over and let me introduce myself. And so she did, bless her heart. And Brandon, that was one of the things you brought up earlier is apologizing. We don't do that very well. And we don't think we, ha we have to in this arena. People just get to do their shit, pardon my French. And, well, don't pardon it, I don't care, but anyway. Uh, people can do and say anything they want to. And if you're the person of color, you're supposed to take that. And, you know, and it's on you to be nice and civil and all that. Well, you know, a hard day in the city, I wasn't up for it. So uh, that's how that happened. And so then I was able to start over with her and, uh, you know, and we had a very pleasant conversation. And as it turns out, um, that's one of the things that I teach is about respectful inquiry. Okay. Do you ask children about the parents? Hell no. 
you know, because they speak English and the parents don't, it's none of the child's business to be asking, um, you know, uh, questions that children shouldn't know about their parents. So anyway, I, I, don't get me started because you need detail. I get excited. Okay. I'll just back up here. I love your stories, Vivian. We um, are just about out of time, but the last question that we had um, was, how do you end the conversation with people without ending the relationship? Mm -hmm. This is sort of a teaser for the next um, discussion next month. Um, and, and anybody can, can answer that one. I'll dive out there first again. <laughs> I think when, whenever you're ending a conversation, but you're trying to maintain a relationship, it's okay to state that. It's okay to just let your attentions be known. This conversation that we're currently having isn't feeling right for me right now. I care about you as a friend, family member, partner, whatever the case may be, coworker. But I think that, you know, we can either continue this conversation another time or I would not like to have this conversation with you any further. Um, I know that's a very hard thing to do in a state like Minnesota, where everyone's very passive aggressive, but that sometimes it takes that level of assertiveness to make sure you're taking the best care of yourself and that you're, you know, not causing any harm to yourself by having other people respond to you in a negative way. Yeah, and, and I agree with that somewhat, not somewhat, but I do agree with that, but to add on, um, with my experience and my pops, uh, all the disagreements is like, I've learned from different classes and experiences how to control my anger, which is primarily walking away from the conversation because I tend to say things I don't mean, right? When I'm, which, which a lot of people do anyway. So I tell my pops like, hey, I love you dad, but I'm feeling myself getting upset and I don't want to snap. So let me walk away and we can continue this later on. Um, he used to take, take that offensive and now he knows that I truly mean like, hey, if I don't leave, I'm snapping, right? So that's his, going like, hey, you got to walk away, he'll cool off and he'll come back to his conversation instead of me just leave up and leave me because he's African, I'm African, that don't fly. So yeah, definitely letting him know, hey, I love you, I care about you, but I'll come back later with this conversation. Any last words of wisdom, Doug or Vivian? I have a little hype thing to share that we use in our group, I'd like to share it with all of you. This is the manual that we uh, use in our uh, equity task force. Um, and it's awesome. It's uh, how to set up action groups. It's available, uh, download on the, on the internet, the beautiful PDF. It leads you through the change process step by step, makes it not scary, not too academic. Uh, I feel like anybody can use this as a, as a resource. So I wanted to share this with, with all of you. It's called Connecting Public Dialogue to Action and Change, a Workbook. Uh, outstanding. And um, it's really brought us far um, to use this as a, as a manual. So is that available to us? Yeah, you feel it's a yeah. Google it up. It's right. You'll be able to find it. Okay, okay. It's uh, everyday democracy is uh, are the people that put this thing out, and uh, it's really well done. It comes in, you know, with just all the pages, three three hole punch it out. Give give it to all of our participants um, in our task force to help help uh, keep us on on our focus. And we can send out a link to that in a follow-up email for, for everyone. Okay then, well, we really wanna thank you all again, Vivian, Doug, Timmy, Brandon, for being part of this conversation, especially now during this extremely stressful time uh, with all the upheaval and uncertainty um, of this week and this whole uh, time. Um, and thank you all at home for watching, for your questions and comments. Again, the recording of tonight's event will be on the YSB and St. Croix Family Resource Center's websites. Please feel free to share it. And uh, we hope you will join us for our next conversation on Thursday, December 3rd, where we will be talking about how to care for self and the relationship during di diversity, equity, and inclusion conversations. So take care and good thank night. You. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Bye-bye.